All right, Merry Christmas. Well, thank you very much. It's good to have us here together for worship. Uh, if you did not, we had a wonderful Christmas cantata last night. If Yes, that's a good response. And if you weren't able to be here, then uh, you can still watch it online on our YouTube channel or our church website. And you can take a look. It's very well done. You'll love it. Uh, the recording is very well done as well. All right, a lot of announcements. I'm going to highlight just a couple. Let's remember, next Sunday, we're not going to have an 8 o'clock service. We will have Sunday school at 9.30 and a regular 10.45 service. And then this Christmas and New Year's Day on Sunday is not going to happen again for another 11 years. So we will not won't have to worry about this. But next week, we will be dropping the 8 o'clock service, but everything else will be normal. Okay, uh, a new ladies' Sunday school class will begin in January. Jan what date is that going to be? On January 8th. And Amanda will, uh, Prugar will be teaching that as information right here in the bulletin. Uh, also, we are still looking for a new office administrator slash bookkeeper. If you're interested, uh, let us know or be praying that we find the right person. And that is all I have. Pastor Nick. Pastor Nick, for Merry Christmas. Let's sing. Please stand and sing. Oh, come on.
Good morning, I am Pastor Nick. <laughs> and I'd like to remind you to please sign up to Give Blood. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet, and it will come very quickly. It's not this week, but it's the week after on January, I believe, 4th. The information's in the bulletin, uh, but please consider that. Uh, we've had someone who needed blood recently, and we were grateful that there happened to be uh, blood available. So thank you uh, for your generosity as well. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he uttered. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for all of your great works and all that you have done for us. Give, your, give us your strength so that we can love you and love one another. And we know that we cannot do anything that is good without you. But you have chosen to do good through us. Father, this morning, gather our hearts and our minds and help us to worship you fully in spirit and in truth. And we ask all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This morning is something that uh, we keep saying it, but you're not going to see this again for 11 years. <laughs> we get to light the Christ candle uh, here to this morning on Christmas. And as we light this candle, we celebrate that God has kept his promise of sending a Savior to rescue us from our sins. It's recorded in Luke's Gospel. And Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And together this morning we rejoice with Christians from every time and every place that Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our King was born just as God had promised us. Amen. Please stand once again and sing, Good Christian and Rejoice. You know, last week we were looking at that passage in the Gospel of Luke where uh, Elizabeth uh, and Mary get together. They're both 
pregnant, Elizabeth with the, the boy that will grow up to be John the Baptist, and of course Mary has Jesus in her womb, and, and they get together. And what strikes us is that Elizabeth and Mary, through no personal worthiness of their own whatsoever, through no efforts of their own, are granted a place in God's eternal plan of salvation. And they shall inherit the kingdom of God. But the same is true of you. The same is true of you. You, Through no personal worthiness of your own whatsoever, but through the worthiness of Jesus Christ, you're granted an eternal home in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, when we think of what we deserve and think of what you have given, we are overwhelmed. Father, we remember where you found us. We remember why you found us. And we remember the cross of Jesus. Father, we're thankful that you sent Jesus. He did come because we were not able to come to you. And we're thankful today for the gifts that you give to your people and the gifted men and women you give to your church. And you know everyone in the sanctuary this morning, Father. And you know the things that sometimes make us so very afraid. The things that when we think about them, they make us blush. You know what keeps us awake in the middle of the night. Father, we're not good enough, but we're yours. So we're here. Meet us in this place through your word and apply it to our minds that we might be thinking Christians. Then drop it down to our hearts that we might be warm, lively Christians. And then get it into our feet that may we, we might go out so others can hear the laughter of the redeemed. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading can be found in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. 
You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior and the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Amen. One of the most common commands in scripture is to sing, to sing praises. And how awesome is it to sing together on Christmas morning? Please stand and sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Our scripture reading can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, 
and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Amen. Before I forget to tell you, it says in your bulletin that there's children's church. There is no children's church today. Children are invited to sit and listen to the message. So when we're done, we can all sit again. But for now, please stand and sing, I Heard the Bells. One of the scariest questions I think you can ever ask yourself is, I mean, does God want me to be his friend? I mean, does God, does he like me? I mean, is he, is he appalled by me? I mean, I mean, would he, could he make me part of his family? Does he have a place for me? Well, the scripture we're looking at, John chapter 1, will help answer some of those questions. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to John chapter 1 in the New Testament. And we start off reading verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. You'll notice how John, he he makes these words sound very much what we read in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, where God, we're told, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John wants us to draw a connection between the beginning of the Bible and, and this person called the Word. 
And, and so he introduces us to Jesus, not at his birth, but at the beginning of time. And the word here, the word in the Greek, it's the word logos. And logos was very interesting. In the first century, all different cultures consider this an important word to know. In Jewish thought, logos referred to God's creative power. In Greek thought, logos referred to the reason or the logic of God that held the entire universe together. So these words were written just at the perfect time in history for all different folks in all different parts of the world to sort of have a sense of the importance of this word logos. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and what did he do? He started to speak things into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, let there be trees, and there were trees. And you see, in God's word, was his creative power was being expressed. You know, I can know something about my neighbor by, by how they dress. I can, you know, wh- how the, what kind of car they drive, you know, their daily habits. I can learn something about them just by observing them. But I can't say I've actually met them until they've spoken to me. You know, a person's word is in many ways the clearest expression of who they are. So when John says that Jesus Christ is the Word of God, he's saying that you really can't know God unless you go through Jesus Christ. Now, you can know things about God without Christ. I mean, you can figure out that there had to be an intelligent creator of intelligence. You've got to have an adequate cause. There has to be a personal creator of that which is personal. You know, we can learn something about right and wrong. Where where does our sense of right and wrong come from? You know, we can learn something about God by what he's made. But if you really want to go and know God personally, it requires Jesus because Jesus is the ultimate expression of who God is. And notice we're told that the word was with God in the beginning, that God the Son, the Lord Jesus, was in a relationship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He always has been. He had no beginning. He just always has been. The relationship in the Trinity, those relationships always have been. They never began. And we're also told, and this almost sounds shocking, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And that sort of says it all. Jesus Christ the Word of God is not just, not just related to God in some way, but He actually is deity. He's God. Well, John goes on in the next couple of verses, and he says, All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, the light of humanity. See, the Word, it, we're told, He is actually the source of, of all physical life. He's the source of all spiritual life. And when, when John, when the Apostle John uses the word light, he is often referring to salvation, being made right with God, being reconciled to God. And then he says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. God's creative power, it's like it invades uh, the evil world. And it creates instant conflict. And you know, Jesus Christ, every day he walked this world, he was in constant conflict with the rest of the world. But John says the darkness has not overcome the light. The word will be attacked. He will be opposed. And yet through his death and resurrection, he will ultimately be victorious. God's goodness through the cross and the empty tomb will conquer evil. And, and people of faith will be brought into the kingdom of God. And then verse 9, he says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Now, what, what would that mean? I mean, we say he's coming into the world. I mean, is that a good thing? I mean, should I be glad 
I mean, I mean, does he? What does he want? We, this this powerful being is coming into the world. Am, am I in trouble? I mean, will he like me? You know, in Germany, at the end of World War II, the people, all the Germans, were wondering when the Americans get here. You know, what will they be like? I mean, are they gonna are they gonna crush us? Are they are they gonna take revenge for all that? I mean, what's gonna happen when they get here? The true light, the word, was coming into the world. That's what John says. And so, naturally, if you're a human being, you would wonder, well, what, what will he be like? H- how is he going to treat us? I mean, will we be crushed? I mean, the idea that we're going to stand in the presence of God, will we be in trouble or maybe mocked? I mean, what is going to happen? In verse 10, John writes, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, Yet the world did not know him. What a curious phrase. He says, the creator of the universe is somehow going to come into the world and nobody's going to recognize him. Now, how can somebody fail to recognize God? Well, the answer is when he enters the world as a baby and they place him in a feeding trough in a manger when he grows up in just a regular, you know, not a standout Jewish home, he learns a regular trade like all the other young men and goes to work every day, and he, he just seems so ordinary. Jesus just looked so ordinary. And that's, that's how God could enter into the world and people not recognize him. But the story gets even stranger in the next verse. He came to his own and his own people, for the most part, they did not receive him. They, they didn't have any interest in him. I mean, even the word's own people do not appreciate him. And we think, no, surely the Jewish people, certainly the Israelites, will see him for who he is. I mean, and, and, and there's another question. What kind of a God shows up in this world in such a way that it's possible for people to miss him? I mean, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? I mean, that's not the way you think God would enter into space and time. I mean, you think if God's going to show up, he's going to come with a blinding flash of light, the roar of thunder, with thousands of well-armed angels at his side. That's what you would expect, but the truth is people miss Jesus. A lot of people didn't even recognize him. So you wonder, why, why doesn't God just act like God. Why doesn't he be more godish in the way he shows up? Well, the answer is, we would have died of fright. You know, God said to Moses, nobody can look directly at me and live. And then Isaiah, and and when he saw that vision of God's glory in the temple, he said, woe is me, I'm undone. I mean, I'm toast. I've seen God. See, the word had to sort of sneak into, even though he made the world, he had to sneak in through a side window. And in his great love for you, his great love for me, for everyone, he came as an infant. He came as a child. Later on, as, he, as a man, there would be a lot of people. There would be crooks and prostitutes and a lot of folks that weren't, weren't keeping God's law, were not keeping the Ten Commandments very well, and yet, they would, have been, they would have been afraid to approach God, but they were not afraid to approach Jesus. See, he was God in human flesh, and he was vulnerable and approachable. So, now, now some do welcome the word. Obviously, many of you have welcomed him. The, the apostles welcomed him. Verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who be- there's the key, who believed in his name, They had faith in who he is. He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, there's a story told, I believe we've told it before, about a courtroom, and and there's a judge there in long, dark robes, and a prisoner, handcuffed, is led into the courtroom. And, you know, he's scared. I mean, he looks at the judge, and he's terrified. His heart quakes, and he's filled with fear. And he has good reason to fear, because that judge is about to pronounce sentence upon him 
for his crime. But then suddenly, a boy, a small boy comes into the courtroom, and he just works his way front through the spectators, and he runs up to the judge. He, whis- he whispers something into his ear. The judge reaches into his pocket and pulls out a dollar bill and gives it to the boy, and he goes skipping off, very content, in a very happy mood. See, that boy had no fear of the, the judge in the long, dark robes because the judge was, was his dad. It was a different kind of relationship. He was not fearing his father as, as judge, but he, he had the father-son relationship. And so it is with all those who receive Jesus Christ by having faith in his name. In, in Christ, God is to us what that judge was to the little boy our father, our dad, and we can approach him because the judgment for our sins has fallen on Jesus instead of upon us, and it creates a whole new relationship. It will say, well, how? How does one have this relationship with God? How do you receive him? Well, it says right here in verse 12, it says, uh, who believe in his name. It's through faith plus nothing else. It is faith all by itself in Christ. And it has nothing to do with a person's genes. It has nothing to do with their past. It has everything to do with God himself. That means that you, through faith in Jesus Christ, through through faith you are a child of God. Let that sink in this this Christmas morning. I mean, it almost sounds unbelievable. For you, you know, you're... you're you're a good-looking group, but you're still pretty ordinary. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're a pretty ordinary group of people, and here we are sitting in this. I mean, believe me, there's people all over America that have never heard of Harmony, Pennsylvania. I mean, I never heard about it until I came here years ago. Uh, but yet, despite the fact we're so ordinary, we can say that through faith in Jesus, we are actually children of the God who made the universe. What an amazing thing! Just to try to let that sink in. Well, let me read to you verses 14 and 16. And John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 16, For from His fullness we've all received grace upon grace. See, Jesus is the Word, the Logos, made flesh. The divine made human. God made vulnerable. God made putting himself at risk, God coming into the world defenseless. See, only Christianity teaches that the divine creator of the world came down as a human person and willingly made themselves vulnerable to evil. I mean, most religions, I mean, God doesn't get all tangled up with stuff like that. In fact, in the Greek world, at the time this was written, uh, The idea that God would want to have anything to do with stinking human flesh, it was was offensive, that that God would even want to mess around with a human body. But Christianity teaches that God made himself vulnerable to evil. You know, there are times when people, and there are some some famous cases of this happening, someone will be mugged, they'll be attacked in a city, and they'll start screaming for help. And, And there was one case, this was decades ago, but someone opened a window, and, and the, the perpetrator ran away. But nobody was willing to come down out of the apartment and help this young woman because they didn't want to get hurt. So eventually the perpetrator, he just turned around and came back, and, and he hurt this young woman very badly. Why, why wouldn't people come if someone's crying for help? Because sometimes when people are afraid of getting hurt, they, they just shut their ears and, and they stay away. See, Christmas tells us that when the creator of the universe heard our cries for help, he came down, he put himself at risk. In fact, he he came down knowing for sure that it would cost him his life. He wasn't just taking a a 50-50 chance. He knew for sure what he was going to have to go through. Because the word has become flesh, he understands you because he's been right where you've been. He gets you. He knows everything about you. You know, I once saw this movie. I don't even, I don't even think I saw the whole movie. I, saw, I just watched enough to learn the plot. But it was about a surgeon who was arrogant 
self-centered guy, and he viewed his patients like, like cattle. They, they were just a means for him to demonstrate his expertise as a surgeon. He was really an awful person. And then he was diagnosed with cancer. And he, he had to go through the same system and sit in the same waiting rooms as everybody else. And he became a much more sympathetic, empathetic human being. And after that, he never treated another patient rudely again. See, Christmas is making a statement that no other religion can make. The Lord of heaven, in a sense, allowed himself to contract cancer and to experience hunger and loneliness, and even homelessness, all kinds of grief, rejection, betrayal, even torture, even in gross injustice. I mean, have you ever been hurt? So has he. Have you been betrayed by someone close to you? So was he. Are you lonely sometimes? Jesus was lonely. Are you facing a crisis? Maybe you're facing a crisis right now. Jesus knows what it's like to face a crisis. Are you broke? Jesus went through much of his adult life broke. So you can go to him. You can have confidence in him. Maybe someone's thinking right now, or you've thought before, you know, I went to him one time when I was, or maybe several times, I went to him when I was down, and he never answered my prayer. I, I, I was hurting. I said, Lord, you got to help me, and, and nothing changed. And I feel abandoned by God. Now listen, God has experienced that too. I mean, God, God, this is going to sound kind of funny. God knows what it's like to feel abandoned by God. Does that sound kind of crazy? It's true. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed. He said, Father, if there's some way that we can save the world without me going to the cross and coming under your, your anger, your hatred of sin, if there's some way I don't have to come under your judgment, your terrible wrath, please take this cup of suffering and agony. Please take it away from me. And you know what God the Father said? He said, no. No, no, Jesus. Uh, I mean, he, Jesus, he vetoed Jesus' earnest request. He said, no, this is the only way we're going to go through with this. You know, when you've got problems and you pour your heart out to God, but it seems like nothing's changing and you feel like God is not listening to you, you remember that Jesus really has been right there. Remember his words on the cross? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows what you're feeling. Jesus prayed for his heavenly Father to take away the hurt, and the Father said, no. Jesus, the Word, the Logos of God, he knows your pain. He even knows what it's like to feel abandoned by God. So you can go to him with anything you're going through, and he really, really understands. You know, a lot of times people are afraid to go to God and let their hair down and talk about their hurt and their fear and, and God, you know, where were you? I need you, right? Where are you? Because we, a lot of times we're afraid that God will just backhand us across the face. Maybe some of us were raised that way if you brought up any questions, you got in trouble. But you don't have to be afraid to go to him because Jesus is your high priest and he knows exactly what it feels like for prayers to not be answered the way you want. He knows what it feels like to be abandoned even by God himself. Now note the phrase, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word that's translated dwelt into English actually says he came and he tabernacled among us, and we have seen his glory. Now remember from the time of Moses on, from the book of Exodus, God's glory resided in that tent structure that was called the tabernacle. It was in Old Testament days. That's where people worship God. And, and then later on, it was moved into the permanent temple in Jerusalem. 
But God's, God's glory was in that tabernacle. And in that place, God set up a sacrifice system and he established a priesthood while God himself lived in the most holy place behind that veil. Um, and that, that veil protected people from being killed by seeing the glory of God. And God said, you know, you cannot look upon my glory, nor can you even touch it. It will be there, but it will be hidden in the tabernacle. Now, according to John 1, verse 14, everything has changed now that the Word has become flesh. Jesus is the new tabernacle. All God's glory is, not, we're not looking for a physical building anymore, but all of God's glory is in the person of Jesus. God's glory is no longer restricted to some geographical spot. Okay, you say, well, that's interesting, but so what? You know, why, why, why does that really matter? Well, for one, it matters because Christmas is now the end of religion as we know it. Jesus is now our temple. Jesus is our priest. Jesus is even our sacrifice. He offered himself so that we could be forgiven our sins. Other religions say, you know, do this stuff. Follow these rituals or, or sacrifice these animals or go through these routines and then God will accept you. But Christianity says you're already accepted by God. It has all been, everything has been done for you by the Lord Jesus and his cross and by the empty tomb. So now you live differently because God's already satisfied with you. You're, you're not jumping through hoops anymore. God says, but based on what my son did for you, you're fine with me. And that motivates us to want to live differently. See, Jesus is the end of all temples and sacrifices. Now, another reason why uh, that Jesus tabernacled among us matters so much is because we can behold the glory of God in Christ. You know, why couldn't Moses behold God's glory? When somebody hurts or betrays you in a life-changing way, there's a gulf, there's a rift that opens up between you and that other person. It, is, it can be, you know, if you've been hurt enough, it's a very serious you know, breach between you and the other person. And do you know why you sense that gulf between you and the other person? It's because you are created in the image of God. That's why. For people made in the image of God, injustice and evil, they create a sense of, of alienation. They create that gulf. And you can't just, if you're hurt badly enough, you can't just shrug it off. That rift that you and I experience between us and another person, or when, when we offend each other, that is nothing compared to the infinite chasm between humanity and God. I mean, you know what it's like when there's been pain between you and another person. Just walking in the other room, you feel weird being around them. But the rift between humanity and God is, is, is an infinite one because of what we've done to creation, what we've done to one another. We have all dishonored God whether we realize it at the time or not, but the fact is we have dishonored God. And the rift, the, the, the chasm between us and God is huge. And God says that something has to happen to close that chasm, to reconcile God and humanity. Something needs to be done. There has to be some kind of atonement that occurs. Now, the Old Testament tabernacle and all that priestly and sacrificial system was pointing to it because, you know, there were these sacrifices and priests, but they were looking ahead. Now, Christ himself, God has come in the flesh, and he tabernacled among us. Jesus came to earth on purpose to become vulnerable. Why? So that he could be killed. <laughs> Why do you want to do that? so that he could pay the price and close the gap and bring reconciliation between us and God. That's why at Christmas, God's glory resides in a baby. 
In the Old Testament, God's glory usually appears as smoking mountains and earthquakes and lightning bolts and, and pillars of fire. But at Christmas, we learn that the inexpressible majesty of God and the transcendent holiness of God are found in, in an infant, in a feeding trough in Bethlehem. Oh, what does that mean? Well, a baby, is an infant, is safe. You can touch a child. You can hold a child. Jesus has died on the cross, and he's paid your debt, and he's healed the, the rift so that you can forever dwell in God's glory and behold God's glory. And that's where we're headed one day. This world's going to melt, and it's going to be remade, redone, and we will look directly upon the glory of God forever and ever and ever. So when you go to him, he offers you wave upon wave of grace. And you can know that your sins, past, present, and future, are all forgiven. And everything will ultimately work out in your favor. And you know I don't mean that everything's going to turn out in this life exactly the way you were thinking it would or you dreamed it would. But ultimately, the greatest good will be given to you. He does and will extend. Jesus extends his scarred hands, his wounded side and feet. He extends his arms to welcome you and says, welcome home, child. The Bible says now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Jesus returns, we will see him as he is. And if we have faith in Christ, we'll hear the wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that the babe in the manger grew up to be our Savior on the cross. And as, as horrible as that was, it was all for us that we would be saved. And then Jesus conquered the grave and now we have eternity to look forward to in your presence, knowing your love and your kindness, your, your, your smile forever. Father, thank you for the Christmas cantata and all the work that went into that. Thank you for the message of Christ, the Savior has come. We praise you, Father, that in the nation of Papua New Guinea, Bible translation has just been leaping forward. So now people in, in all different remote tribal groups can read the Bible and read the story of Jesus themselves. And we pray, Father, that in that country of Papua New Guinea, that there would be effective teaching of Christians, that they, they would understand the Scriptures, understand all that's been done for them. Father, we thank you for our secret prayer sister ministry and for all the, the women that are praying for one another. Prayer is, Father, such a wonderful thing. Father, you know everybody with a health need. We, we're praying for Judy. You keep on healing her knee. Uh, we think of Susan and her health needs. We pray for Larry and Scott, bring healing to them. And, and for Carolyn, who took a nasty fall, Father, her dislocated shoulder, broken uh, ball of her humerus, Father, lots of pain. It's your property to have mercy. Show your compassion to her, Father. Give her relief. We think of Krista, our missionary, who was just diagnosed uh, with leukemia. We pray for healing for her. We pray for Cindy as she recovers from foot surgery. We think of, of Julia, uh, who, who's been struggling a lot of health issues. We pray for Jim, and we pray for Marlene and for Debbie as they recover from surgeries and ailments. And thank you for your kindness. At no time are you ever looking the other way or ignoring us. Father, we pray for new people to be willing to train and serve as Stephen ministers, to be there to show compassion to people in pain. Uh, we pray you would provide us with a new office manager. Uh, Father, we thank you for Javier and Sole Abera who have been serving you in Mexico, and we pray they would thank you for we thank you that now tribal people are now coming to the Bible school to get training so they can go teach the Bible in their different tribes. And we think of Christy Jansma. We we 
We think of how hard it must be this year after the, you know, her husband very unexpectedly died. And we pray you would comfort her. And we pray that as she goes to work on the missionary kids care team, that she would be a great help to many families. And Father, on this Christmas morning, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.